Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Antley. I am a committee member here for Theorizing the Web. I'm also the treasurer. Um, I have a PhD in Russian history, which is super useful. <laughs> super useful. I can tell you all about it uh, if you want to know later. First, we'll start with. Uh, oh, I did my job your last days. And what's your last name? Uh, Jonas. And Jonas. Sorry, I should have wrote up last names here. And Jonas is a PhD student at the School of Information at Berkeley. She's going to discuss how regional web blocking enforced by companies and internet services are extensions of economic and social discriminations that promote global inequality and increased precarity. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about geoblocking and regional discrimination online. And I use regional blocking to describe the denial of access to websites and services based on someone's location and in particular their country, by website owners, as opposed to the state or third-party systems like internet providers. I argue that this practice is both materially and ideologically harmful to those who encounter it, and that uh, attending to the consequences of this configuration and the rationales behind it can help us be aware of harder to detect biases that are increasingly being embedded across the web. I'll first give some descriptions of these blocks, how people respond to them, and the dream that this is a transitional moment and that such blunt forms of blocking will soon become unnecessary. And I'll suggest to the contrary that regional blocking will likely only further be incorporated into a wider range of digital platforms. Some scenarios. A teenager in Brazil tries to order beauty products. A traveler in Singapore goes to book an upcoming flight. A nonprofit fundraiser attempts to manage their donation tools. A shopper in Trinidad looks to browse the latest fashions. Workers in Ghana and Pakistan attempt to purchase templates for their websites. A freelancer in Palestine requests payment from a foreign client. A creative entrepreneur in Nigeria hopes to sell her products. A consultant in Cameroon pursues a Bitcoin purchase. In each of these cases, based on real accounts, People find their intentions online thwarted by the decisions of corporate actors to restrict their access to web services based on geolocation. This research is motivated by incidents my advisor Jenna Burrell, who's a sociologist, documented in her book Invisible Users, where she learned from her interlocutors at internet cafes in Accra, Ghana, that some prominent internet dating sites, like eHarmony and PlentyOfFish.com, Previously one of the key platforms through which young Ghanaians were forming relationships with people around the world were beginning to ban Ghanaians from their websites entirely, claiming as justification high rates of fraud originating in the country. Drawing on the scholarship of anthropologist James Ferguson, she warned that these kinds of blocks may lead to some people in post-colonial societies to feel rejected from an imagined online and egalitarian sphere, writing, the potential is present for a process of objection of particular real-world geographies from cyberspace. So people run into three major types of commercial blocks based on geography. Complete denial, usually with a generic access denied error page. Unavailable services, where people can see a website but cannot sign up for an account and or purchase a product or the service, or will have their purchase canceled or their account closed after their attempt and additional barriers to service, where users are presented with extra hoops to jump through in order to authenticate themselves, such as CAPTCHAs or being asked to provide additional documentation. In addition to dating sites, these blocks often occur in e-commerce, travel, and banking or payment platforms. When people turn to social media to ask about these blocks, the responses they receive often don't make sense or address the conditions on the ground generating consternation among users who feel that they are being forcibly kept out of participating in platforms that could benefit them. Customer service representatives of e-commerce companies, for example, often state that a website is inaccessible for people in a certain location because the store does not ship to addresses there. Even though customers are accustomed to that fact and have developed workarounds, which I'll address in a minute, to deal with such limitations. Many commenters respond to these statements by evoking parallels between limiting website access and other contemporary spaces in which people are blocked from entry based on their nationality, with phrases like, who manages this policy, Donald Trump? And maybe Macy's would like to build a wall too. The metaphor of the wall highlights how these blocks deny opportunities for adaptation or exception. As Burrell explains, the shift towards IP address blocking and other administrative filtering makes exclusion systematic, total, and materially concretized. 
Although online shopping may seem like a relatively trivial area of discrimination compared to other instances of unreliable or inaccessible systems, to paraphrase one Twitter user who encountered such blocking, the discovery that one's country is unavailable in a list of drop-down options can lead to feelings of erasure and marginalization. In addition to the ideological weight of exclusion, blocks can simply be logistically annoying or expensive. Locally available products might be heavily taxed and of unreliable quality. In a study on online shopping in Indonesia, a team led by anthropologist Tom Belstorff found in their interviews with gay men that respondents emphasized that one reason they bought makeup online was that they felt safer doing so in a more anonymous fashion, and that for transgender respondents, one reason they used online shopping for purchasing women's clothing was that it was easier to find sizes that fit, highlighting the stakes of online shopping for personal safety and well-being. Further, online marketplaces are not only consumer platforms, but also offer opportunities for people to sell their own goods and services. In places with limited market demand for particular products or labor, people are especially incentivized to turn to cross-border options for income in the form of sales or freelancing. Regional restrictions on Amazon seller accounts or the ability to accept money transfers through ubiquitous financial services like PayPal thus directly interfere with the ability for people in places like Nigeria, Ghana, Pakistan, or Palestine to take advantage of internet access to increase their economic opportunities. As the advocacy group Americans for a Vibrant Palestinian Economy wrote in an open letter, PayPal's abstinence is a major obstacle to the growth of Palestine's tech sector and the overall economy. While other payment portals are available, there is no replacement for the trust and familiarity that PayPal inspires among potential users. While some companies implement blocks to comply with local regulations around content or data storage or may require additional documentation or verification due to know your customer uh, or anti-money laundering requirements, frequently companies put regional blocks in place in response to vague and amorphous security concerns. One anti-fraud professional told me candidly that weird countries like Ghana and Nigeria would typically be blacklisted on e-commerce sites along country, alongside countries that face legal sanctions, like North Korea and Iran. For what it's worth, one director of IT operations at a large company referred to such blocks as snake oil when it comes to security protection, procedures implemented to look like you're addressing a problem, even if they're completely ineffective. Of course, people are innovative and often adapt quickly to, put, to barriers put in the way of reaching their goals. Common workarounds to regional blocking include the use of virtual private networks, VPNs, third-party purchasing by friends or from a company that will shop for you for a fee, freight forwarding services, and the growth of alternative local suppliers. Yet even as entire markets spring up providing the means to navigate dominant commercial blockages or to offer local alternatives, the workarounds that people develop to bypass group-level blocks become in themselves new sources of access to be denied. As a security solution, automated refusal based on country-level blocking is seen among many professionals who work on fraud detection, identity verification, and network administration as a somewhat embarrassing, old-fashioned solution that is destined for obsolescence as machine learning-based systems develop more sophisticated measures of targeting bad actors. One interview reassured me that these systems would facilitate a transition from crude evaluation of risk based on a pool of people like you to assessments more directly tied to an individual's behavior, reflecting the risk you actually pose, and removing the threat of discrimination. He went further, arguing that identity verification based on behavioral history could be a potential vector for financial inclusion, because if someone can be identified on the basis of their digital footprint, they need not have a bank account. In short, automated analysis of behavioral patterns using machine learning is proposed as a solution to allow access to more of the good guys. Yet despite claims that geoblocking is outdated, newer systems also rely on geography as a feature in algorithmic classification and threaten to indirectly worsen the situation despite their intentions by camouflaging regional dis discrimination as personalization. And many of these systems work by combining behavioral patterns with documentation issued by trusted partners that may be differentially inaccessible to some depending on their location, whether that's a national passport or a LinkedIn profile. So location is still being used as a feature of machine learning based systems, but it's harder to see. Further, fraud detection and identity verification systems frequently flag the use of workarounds such as VPNs, proxies, and third party purchasing and freight forwarding as suspicious 
As other scholars have established, anonymity networks such as the well-known TOR increasingly face differential treatment and even outright blocking as a response to accusations of malicious use. Many media streaming websites have adjusted their blocking policies to try to prohibit VPN access altogether. Facebook security researchers refer to this process as an adversarial cycle, where defenders of security target bad features of bad actors that are hard for them to change, such as IP address features and successive geodistance, the distance from one location login to the next, and the adversary adapts to avoid such detection, here by using a VPN or proxy network, and the defender subsequently flags this response. Thus, because people use VPNs to get around regional blocks, VPNs themselves become the target of blocks. So services that make use of machine learning for fraud detection, like Count, promote proxy piercing to counter fraud, arguing that proxy servers are used because a fraudster conducting a stolen credit card transaction wants to appear to be in the same location as the owner of the stolen card. This ignores the use cases of those who are attempting to circumvent regional blocks in order to make legitimate purposes purchases, or simply to browse a website, and cast a negative valence on their behavior. In their article, Seeing Like a Market, sociologists Marianne Forcade and Kieran Healy explore a similar process, arguing that as behavioral patterns that arise as much from a response to circumstance as from individual agency, are activated to sort people into categories of risk. And then scores become ethically meaningful indexes of one's character, Bad outcomes are nothing but the mechanical translation of bad habits and personal failures. In this case, because proxies and VPNs are associated with criminal activity, using them becomes a marker of being criminal, even though the very same underlying system of categorization and blocking might lead a good actor to use these services to begin with. So these efforts become especially pernicious as the technology used to limit entry in e-commerce can quickly be migrated to an arena even more directly relevant to one's life chances. The creators of technology put in place in order to comply with state regulations, for one, are incentivized to find new use cases for their products. For example, Jumio's identification verification system is moving from the financial world of know your customer policies into the sharing economy and dating ecosystem, offering promises of greater physical security for users. So as fraud detection and identity verification systems spread and digital platforms consolidate their services, regional blocking threatens to become embedded across more and more of the online landscape. This precedent threatens to further ostracize those who are excluded from digital recognition. Thus, the legacies of inequality on the web are not easily banished and become harder to locate as they migrate across domains, putting down roots in new spaces under different auspices. By paying close attention to the evolving deployment of regional barriers on commercial websites now, we have an opportunity to work towards a more just alternative. Thanks so much. Matthew, what was, what's your last name? Sikelic. Matthew Sikelic, thank you. Matthew's from Troy, that's awesome, we love New York people. Matthew's from Troy, New York, and holds an MA in Theater and Performance Studies from the University of Buffalo. He will discuss how the recent revelations of the global heat map created by the fitness app Strava reveals a proxy map of imperialism and a telltale legacy of America's global war on terror. It also reveals the tension between states and the apps that our citizens use creating new power dynamics based upon EULAs more so than state sovereignty. Forgive me if you all know what Strava is. I'm going to walk through the whole thing. Strava is a fitness app. I have it on my phone. It's a free app that sells premium subscriptions. I've used it in the past, along with many others, to track my bike rides. I always use it for running. I don't like running. <laughs> Using GPS, a military technology, it collects distance, time, and elevation, plots these as routes on a map, and uploads that data to be shared with users' friends, and the place to choose the public. It's my space for runners and cyclists. Laps may be compared on given segments against oneself and against strangers. Users can thus gamify their runs into a durational race with unlimited heats, convening to be a king of a route as if Strava were four square circa 2012. Some users misuse Strava and as doodle to find the logic that encourages repeatable routes. No one is going to be doing power laps around Santa. But this use, I think, foregrounds the visual culture and potential of, of Strava. This is a cartography by the performing body, 
a map of how the world is used rather than how it is conceptualized. If this map annotates a street grid, how those annotations happen is by self-selected people interacting with their built and natural environment, not a survey of that environment. These routes are traces of people interacting with the material world. Strava has a data analysis or data monetization wing, Strava Metro, that markets these aggregate traces of pedestrian and cyclist data as an urban planning tool to cities. This is the global heat map. Composed of that same aggregate, its apparent purpose is to be a cool marketing tool for Strava, where there is more heat, there are more members, as Strava calls them, using those trails and streets. Cities burn hot, deserts cold. The map shows a fairly stark contrast between industrialized, wealthy nations and those that are not. But some dark locales burn bright. What Strava calls activity density marks out difference, making for some remarkable images. In Nevada's Black Rock Desert, Burning Man's regular patterns create a techno sigil. This could be the logos of your next uh, tech startup. So if anyone's looking for a, to be the next Peter Thiel, here you go. But here's a pentagon with no heat. Its architecture betraying no sign of the activities inside, not that it should, people aren't going on runs there. But in the same way that a blank spot outlines something, the bright spots jump out from their surrounding geography as out of place. In January, Nathan Ruser at NRG 8000, an undergraduate at Australian National University studying international security in the Middle East, tweeted, and this is his pinned tweet, it looks very pretty, but not amazing for OPSEC. US bases are clearly identifiable and mappable, accompanied with images like this one of a US airstrip in Syria. This triggered a series of rather alarmist headlines, as headlines are wont to be, such as the Strava heat map and the end of secrets in Wyoming right. from Engadget. Strava's fitness heat maps are a potential catastrophe. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation contributed Strava's heat map revealed military bases but it also showed nothing is anonymous online. And my favorite from the Washington Post, US soldiers are revealing sensitive and dangerous information by jogging. <laughs> At first glance, this looks much like an image uh, uh, shot from um, space of the Earth at night with population centers lighting. But bright spots in the dark stand out. Uh, could they be villages that are otherwise totally disconnected from the grid? And I think there's some, some resonation here with, with what's blacked out in the prior talk. This is the heat map's rendering of Niger. Looking closely, you can see a couple spots of heat. Uh, one appears outside the city of Agadez, but that heat is well outside the city of 120,000, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the, in the Sahara. This is Air Base 201, a massive drone base currently under construction. But this site isn't a secret. The New York Times ran a story on the $100 million base this past Sunday, comparing it to local geography for scale, two and a half central parks. So we can see here the geography of the war on terror, mapped with convenient pan and zoom functions rendered in multiple fun colors. I saved these images a few uh, weeks ago, but the map is updated monthly. Here's the same site as of Tuesday, showing its growth on the map. But some sites have disappeared from the heat map since January. The headlines aren't totally wrong. The US Department of Defense denies any secrets were revealed, but are reviewing their security protocols nevertheless. Presumably, some individual users have changed their security settings. Strava now requires that a user register and log on to view more detailed data, and they have pledged to work with the governments. Their CEO expressed regret that Strava members in the military, humanitarian workers, and others living abroad may have shared their location in areas without other activity density, and in doing so, inadvertently increased awareness of sensitive locations. From airfields in Iraq, to forward operating bases in Afghanistan, to border checkpoints in Syria, these images defy the logic of the security state. Here are remote military positions, perhaps some are classified, perhaps some are even black, lit up for curious fitness buffs to find. The regular patterns of military patrols and supply routes supplement workouts to carve data onto the map. 
These heats are the endless laps of military patrols, the loops of Humvees, the body heat of empire. What should be secure installations instead leak their data and glow like fireflies. These soldier users serve under Strava's terms of service. Here is a non-state actor rendering soldiers as data available to all other registered users. These remote data points quite literally highlight a tension between surveillance by private capital and the norms of state security and control. Parasites on Western imperial interventions and technology, these visualizations deliver military contractors as both consumers and media product. Corporate data collection creeps further towards ubiquity. Special forces are not exempt. This is governance by app, whose developers will transform users into objects at their first chance. These sites intruding onto the desert are not revealing secrets. Those on the ground know who is there, so much as power. Maps have always been a tool of imperial power, a tool to control the spread of information, a way to chart resources to exploit. The blank fields here are blank because of the structures of capital. The bright spots in the desert, bright because of empire. What's revealed is a private company knowing more than it should, stepping into terrain the state would reserve for itself. So these secrets are revelations more to the Western public than to, say, ISIS fighters in Raqqa being attacked by special forces. This is the army, which we are not supposed to see, fighting in the war, which we are not supposed to think about, nominally concealed from Western subjects by the operations of empire. These are the lands of non-peoples, only made visible to Americans as it suits American interests, who will then create hot sites in the desert in order to kill them. I quote artist geographer Trevor Paglin, who has spent a lot of time looking at black sites. Geography theory tells us that it really isn't possible to make things disappear, to render things non-existent. Geography tells us that secrecy, in other words, is always bound to fail. And because secrecy is always bound to fail, perhaps counterintuitively, it tends to grow stronger. So these images depict a failed secrecy, and they evidence that secrecy has already strengthened. As the heat map reminds us with the inescapable materiality of geography, there are people there doing this work. Like the doodles it, of snowmen, it is performers tracing their lives. Abstract monumental land art for corporate consumption, digital Nazca lines come crop circles for King Ozymandias. If in this rendering these sites resemble small American towns more than Iraqi villages, save for the extraordinary hardness of patrol-drawn boundaries, it is because they are American towns in miniature. The closed loops of these bases disconnect them from their surrounding structures, linking them instead to the flows of data and global capital. Thus, the map collapses the spatial difference between military positions in Yemen and the neighborhood we sit in through the shared technologies that answer to us or that we answer to. Strava has mapped the geography of the West, the geography of empire, of capital. The global heat map is a map of a part of a portion of the internet of Strava users who have their privacy settings set public. It is a map of a post-national territory composed of consumers who are also product. Soldier users on military outposts are not subjects only of the nation state, but like all of us, increasingly under the governance offered by end user license agreements. But these two regimes have more in common than we might think, and the map is, again, instructive. Increasingly, these algorithms and policies are like the black world of the war on terror, unknown, sometimes unknowable, unanswerable to, and incompatible with democracy. Thank you. And then, I think there's any, we have Jasmine. What's your last name, Jasmine? Volve. Jasmine Volve. She lives in Toronto and has her MSc from the London School of Economics, and she will be discussing how states learn from and mimic each other's techniques of surveillance and violence. And this is especially important in the context of settler colonial states, who often learn and pass on their former master's techniques in policing and controlling their own populations. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about cross-border solidarity as a racialized violence and surveillance. Um, I did my best to kind of simplify my terminology as much as possible, so apologies if in simplifying I made it even more confusing and incoherent. 
Um, to start off, I'm going to go through like my own conceptual framework and what I understand, like you know, practices of surveillance and violence to kind of be related. And I'll go into some examples and we'll take it from there. So before we start talking about this, um, I'd like to explain um, a nice little concept by our friend uh, Foucault, which is biopower. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this term. I'm not sure if uh, anyone's familiar with him. It's kind of annoying. Um, but biopower is essentially um, what we can conceptualize as like upholding power and control over bodies. That's like the easiest way I can explain it. Um, you know, uh, Foucault writes that like biopower makes capitalism and the nation state possible. Um, you know, it's just basically about like I guess how the state has power over bodies in various ways. Um, you know, in his writing, Foucault also says that like the old right of sovereignty, like he likes to talk about like old and new sovereignty. Um, the old right of sovereignty, um, you know, the role of the state was to take life and let live. But in our reworkings of state power now, he thinks that it's more so that the, like, the state has the right to make live and let die. So those are kind of like two juxtapositions that I find really interesting. So that's kind of like one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, another concept that I think is relevant to understanding what I'm trying to talk about is necropolitics. Uh, necropolitics is a term that was coined by uh, Achille and Bebe. Um, necropolitics is um, basically technologies of control that subject life to the poet of death and decay. Um, it can be understood as systems of technologies of control that subject life to material and political death. And um, one way of kind of understanding necropolitics would be like, you know, how um, in America, like how the prison system, the prison industrial complex has naturalized surveillance and violence. That's like one like very salient um, point of it. So I think um, biopower and necropolitics, like if we can kind of simplify it, it's, you know, this concept of, you know, um, I guess like, these state entities having control over who has the right to live, who has the right to a certain bodily existence, and who doesn't. Um, another concept that I think is really interesting is um, a concept that uh, Jasmir Kaur um, developed in their book, um, and it's called The Right to Maim. Um, basically, the right to maim is this concept of how states military, etc., can inflict violence in order to cause terror among populations. So in this book, um, the author is highlighting how the uh, Israeli military, um, the IDF, has been inflicting violence on Palestinian um, communities. Um, Poir illustrates this through how, uh, yes, yeah, that. Um, basically, so what they highlight in the book is how the military has been um, in recent years, or maybe even longer, um, has been maiming in the sense that they've been like shooting to maim people. So, you know, shooting at um, individuals like kneecaps and femurs and inflicting bodily harm. So this is like a bit of a different concept than like, you know, extrajudicial killings where they're just, you know, shooting at people, but it's rather keeping these individuals alive but maim. And it's a very specific form of biopower. Um, and I think that um, this concept, the right to maim, sort of alters our conception of living and dying. Um, in the book, like, uh, the writer also talks about like this distinction between living and dying through like the cuts of race and the folds of managing our population are very deliberate. Um, and I think it kind of raises a really interesting question of you know who decides who is worth living. And to what extent does settler colonialism really rely on this particular form of biopower? Um, so these concepts are kind of what brought me to my own question of, you know, how does settler colonialism really rely on biopower through systems of control, specifically through surveillance and violence? And how do states learn from one another? How do states teach each other these behaviors? And how do, you know, these practices get carried on, like, internationally? Um, so, um, another author that I would like to turn to is Simone Brown, um, in her book Dark Matters. Um, she writes about how enactments of surveillance have basically reified physical boundaries along racial lines, thereby reifying race itself, where the outcome of this is often violence and discriminatory treatment. Um, 
in the book, uh, she highlights how racialized surveillance is a technology of social control, where surveillance practices produce norms pertaining to race and power to define what is in and what is out of place. Um, and it's essentially a form of like social control through technology that is working towards reifying race. Um, but there's also a response to this that we have seen in society. So um, Simone Brown has this concept called um, or surveillance. So instead of surveillance, there's surveillance. So it's how um, communities respond to surveillance. Um, Brown conceptualizes it as like an inverse power relation where individuals have responded to surveillance by watching the state. So like a contemporary example would be like, I don't know if you remember like the DACA check-ins on Facebook or you know how people like you know, have started to film police and you know things like that. So it's how communities are responding responding to surveillance. Um, and Brown conceptualizes dark surveillance as a site of critique that tries to acknowledge and describe, like deconstruct the surveillance that takes place in society. Um, so yeah. So now I want to go into um, a kind of other contemporary example that I think is a really interesting example of how states work together to kind of enact biopower in surveillance um, methods. So I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange, also known as Geely or Gilly, I don't know. Um, it was founded in 1992 in uh, Georgia. Um, and basically, it's this police training exchange program where um, US law enforcement have um, been sent to Israel to learn like counterterrorism measures. And like the IDF has come to the US to learn about like community policing and like drug interdiction. And for a long time, it was this very kind of like secretive law enforcement exchange program where nobody really knew <coughs> was being trained. But like over time, like, like these trainings have like become more unfolded. Um, and so um, Devin Springer, who is a writer and activist, and just a side note, like I really recommend you check out their work because they do really important writing. Um, Devin Springer wrote about this um, exchange program, and he commented on how you know this program is an example of how these two countries have taught each other how to enact violence and surveillance. Um, Springer notes how this program is under the guise of counterterrorism, which is you know a term invoked to justify state violence. But really, what's going on is this is kind of an example. This is a bold statement, but how you know you can really see how. This like law enforcement exchange is you know sharing practices of you know crowd control, um, extrajudicial violence, um, surveillance techniques, like all of these. I don't really need to go into the examples of you know what we know the American police force does to marginalized populations and what the IDF does to marginalized populations. Like it's not really my place to go into that. But like this exchange of knowledge and tactics are occurring, and I mean to be very frank, like. One could say that like the U.S. is really learning apartheid techniques, while Israel is learning about control and surveillance of marginalized identities. And I think it's a really interesting example of how we can sort of form these solidarity networks of oppression and how we can do it under the guise of counterterrorism responses and whatnot. Um, so another kind of interesting thing that's been going on um, in relation to this program. Um, the Baltimore Police, Baltimore Police Department. Um, Amnesty International recently wrote a report about how this police department is under investigation by the DOJ for discriminatory practices. Um, and the Baltimore Police Department was one of many police departments that participated in this law enforcement exchange. Um, through this program, they learned about crowd control, use of force, surveillance techniques, and so on and so forth. Um, and once again, like I think this is a really interesting illustration of how state, states can teach violence to one another to uphold power, bio power. Um, and actually, since I wrote this, um, I read like a day or two ago that the um, I think Durham Police Department in the U.S. has actually banned this program from all of their law enforcement um, like trainings. So this is kind of something that's kind of current. Um, so basically. Um, I think what we can gather from these types of programs is that we can kind of trace relationships of how states have learned forms of surveillance and control from one another, but we can also see how this creative networks of individuals who see these changing forms of biopower and respond to it. So you'll recall earlier I was talking about the term dark surveillance, which is how communities kind of respond 
to surveillance. And I think you can see really interesting examples. Um, Devin Springer in um, their writing has spoken about how they had noticed a lot of parallels between seeing how Palestinian activists were mobilizing and responding to surveillance methods and how his kind of like network of activists in Atlanta had been seeing very similar experiences. So I think an interesting takeaway from this is if we have this understanding that states are able to kind of engage and teach these surveillance tactics and these violence tactics with one another, like there is always a response to that and I think that there are other solidarity networks that we can see that are being formed in response to that. And I think that, you know, dark surveillance is a concept that can allow us to think of how we can kind of form this sort of pressure and sort of like respond to this kind of like engaging action. And of course, like the idea of surveillance is that it's meant to kind of respond to this pressure that's being put. And so I think that's a really interesting illustration. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Jan Riazic couldn't be with us here today because he had an unfortunate bicycling accident. We hope you have a swift recovery, Jan. Uh, but he did leave us a short video to watch in his absence. He's a PhD student at the University of Arizona focusing on government and public policy. Hi, I'm Jan, and I'm finishing my PhD at the University of Arizona this year. Well, my heart and mind are with you guys in New York, but unfortunately my body could not be, so I'll try to make up for my absence with this video. And hopefully I'll get to meet many of you down the road. Okay, let's begin. Now, I study some of the most egregious forms of information control on the internet and beyond, and I'm especially interested in the social and political consequences that rapidly advancing connectivity is bringing with it in different parts of the world. So I study how people process information when they're faced with new channels of communication, and when they're faced with a blackout of these same channels. Now, the New York Times and BuzzFeed both recently published exceptional stories about something that happened in Sri Lanka just last month. In Sri Lanka, Buddhist extremists used Facebook and WhatsApp to sustain a campaign of ethnic hatred against the minority Muslim population. There were public pages and Facebook groups openly advocating for violence against Muslims. These posts were reported thousands of times, but Facebook was notoriously slow to respond to these reports, if indeed they responded at all. Now, part of the reason for this was that the number of content moderators on Facebook's team who spoke Sinhalese was two. And then came the riots. A number of people were killed in widespread rioting believed to be stoked by rampant rumors and disinformation about the Muslim minority. In a desperate attempt to stop the spread of these potentially deadly rumors, the government eventually decided to completely block Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. This is what we call a network shutdown, and my research revolves around what happens when that connection with the world is lost. Today I'll tell you about some of the human rights implications of shutdowns from a report I'm releasing in a couple of weeks, and about some of my research on the effectiveness of shutdowns as a means of dealing with protest. So first let's cover the basics. What is a network shutdown? I define it as the intentional, significant disruption of electronic communication within a given area or affecting a certain group of citizens. This framing covers major disruptions to internet access, cell phone service, and social media services whose explicit purpose is to enable many-to-many -many communication and therefore potentially coordination and organization. So this is what a shutdown looks like in practice. What we're seeing here are network measurements from Oracle and Google showing sudden drop-offs in internet traffic. Gabon, Gambia, Togo, Cameroon, and Equatorial Guinea were all cases where mass protests triggered the government to shut down communication on a very large scale. Okay, so why should we care about this? I mean, these are all just isolated, one-off cases, right? Well, it turns out that network disruptions are actually much more common than many people believe. I've been collecting and cross-referencing reports about shutdowns over the last few years, and the estimate that I came up with is that between 2011 and 2017, we've seen about 277 shutdowns across around 40 countries. This translates to around 2,500 cumulative days of disruption across the globe in 2017 alone. Now, the repercussions this has for human rights are greater and often more insidious than is commonly believed, and this includes political rights, civil rights, economic rights, and a few other categories. Under the pretext of curbing rumors and preventing violence, shutdowns sever the connections that enable free expression, but they also disconnect families. They undermine freedom of association, like, say, coordinating a peaceful protest on Facebook. And they disproportionately target groups that are already marginalized and deprived of the affordances of the internet. 
They also provide a sort of invisibility cloak for violence and human rights abuses because the flow of information is obstructed. In Cameroon, we had a blackout that lasted for three months, and that triggered flows of people who have been called internet refugees in search of areas with connectivity. Humanitarian efforts are also disrupted when a shutdown is in place, and to visualize the extent of this impact, all we need to do is look back at Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and the information vacuum that that created. Shutdowns have also crippled local economies. For example, a recent study estimated their cost across Sub-Saharan Africa at $218 million just in 2016. This impact will only become more acute as digital economies continue to grow, driven by a surge of smartphone usage in developing countries. Now, the universe of cases in which shutdowns occur is pretty eclectic. The reasons vary from protests to school exams to mass events, including a Miss Universe swimsuit contest in the Philippines. But by far the number one pretext is public safety concerns brought on by demonstrations and riots. But curiously enough, the effectiveness of network shutdowns as a form of pacifying protest is always assumed, but never tested, at least to our knowledge. And it's worth testing because we've been talking for years about networked social movements and how social media contribute to them. In her book, Twitter and Tear Gas, for example, Zainab Duf actually argued that technology is better at rapidly mobilizing spontaneous collective action than it is at sustaining it, which requires structure and coordination. And blackouts give us the opportunity to test this effect by inverting the circumstances to a scenario where we're dealing with a total digital information vacuum. To try to capture this, I ran statistical tests on very precise daily data on protests around the world from Lockheed Martin. And it turns out that the short-term and long-term dynamics of disconnected protests do actually differ. Protests and riots escalate dramatically in the first week of a network shutdown. But they decline sharply when the shutdown is maintained in subsequent days. The decline starts around week two. So in the long-term scenario, we're dealing with a state that I call a digital scene. And these dynamics clearly differ from when we just consider consecutive days of protest without looking at whether a shutdown is in place, in which case every passing day actually brings more and more protests. So there's a considerable chance that network shutdowns make protest fatigue worse, and I have some indications that this especially applies to highly connected environments. So you might say, okay, so if I'm a dictator, all I really need to do is just to keep the internet off. But that kind of misses a big chunk of the economic argument. Instead, the main takeaway here is that shutdowns are ineffective in the short run and prohibitively expensive in the long run. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, you might be surprised to find out that the country that clearly leads the pack in terms of the, just the raw number of shutdowns it executes is actually not a totalitarian regime. It's actually India. There are plenty of reasons for this, and that's why I'm looking into this case further for another study. But stories like Sri Lanka and India should encourage us to take a step back. It's clear that network shutdowns are not a reasonable response to mass protest, and their effectiveness is also in question. But access to the internet is growing at a galloping pace in many parts of the world, and a critical approach to information does not always come packaged with it. So my hope is that this will help stimulate the discussion on how to make communication networks safer and less burdened by the barrage of disinformation that we see everywhere today. And I would like to challenge you to think about these solutions because you're all amazing thinkers with very creative minds. This is a discussion that we have to have around the world with diverse groups and in every language. Okay, thanks for listening. Uh, feel free to write comments and questions using the TTW18 and C1 hashtags, and I'll tweet back. Um, have a great time. Good luck to Anne, Jasmine, Matthew, and everyone else presenting over the next two days. Take care. video in. That's really great. Um, so now we're going to do the Q&A session here. So I'm going to get this mic over here. I'm going to pass it around. If you guys want to take a seat up the front here so they can see it. Oh, we got a nice Yeah, there we go. Some nice little Brandage. signage. And I just also want to congratulate everybody for staying on time. That is probably one of the first times that's ever happened when I've done these things. So we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. I think that's pretty good. So why don't we go ahead and see, does anybody have any questions? Not all at once, please. <laughs> no, I, nobody. And we'll get this kicking off with the panelists. Do you all have some questions for each other? <laughs> well, I got a question. I'll start with Matt. Right. So Strava obviously is the Matt app that's been in the news recently. Uh, do you see this sort of happening with other apps? Obviously, there's a lot of tracking devices that people are using. 
mean, Trump just got the kind of the, the, the notoriety, but is this occurring in other apps you see, or is this sort of low-key in other places and might bubble to the top? Yeah, I, I think that Strava nearly sort of, um, they, they just made a picture that we can look at of what's already going on, and they made their data public in a, a specific way. But I think, um, I think this is sort of the, the situation that we're all swimming in right now. We all have, the data collection is ubiquitous, it's the business model of pretty much any um, social media company that you can think of, and uh, I, I think it poses a challenge to how, how we deal uh, with, with privacy. Uh, the, 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 like, fail to, um, the failed secrecy isn't just failed government secrecy, but failed personal privacy. So if you have a soldier who's turned off his data, um, it's, it's, I think there's almost a parallel to people realizing that, oh, right, I'm giving all this data to Facebook. Um, and then deactivating their accounts. And that's not really a sustainable solution. I think also something that's interesting that comes up in all of our presentations and in Nons is this issue of if, and, and you kind of suggested this, if they all turn off, then we don't see it anymore. And that, like, there's something about um, these vis the visibility of it that makes it maybe, it, it allows some outrage to develop. These are the things, as you said, that are, are kind of. Um, meant to be uh, obfuscated in our in our lives, and so it's kind of interesting that you know, the privacy reaction is like, oh, you should just turn off your data, um, but that 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 eliminates the ability to kind of form those like those solidarity networks that you were talking about, Jasmine, that that allow for collective responses. Those are, are a little bit at odds, it seems like. Right, and I mean, at the end, you kind of I think you said something something along the lines of this is kind of like secrecy bound. Fail. So maybe as a follow-up to that, like, what is the extent to which like privacy is an intended, um, you know, intended practice? Like, to what extent are you know these various sites like being made to become legible as a form, as like being like a very like physical symbol of, as you said, like you know, of empire and stuff like that? Like, what is the extent to which like we're actually even trying to like invoke privacy? I think we all know people who. Um, Sort of move through the world. And, yeah, they don't want Facebook collecting their data, so you know they, they don't carry or they, they don't have Facebook. Uh, you know, there's the, the extreme example would be someone who you know carries their their phone around in a in a, um, in a Faraday pouch. Um, but that also sort of misses the point. Like you're still being tracked, you know, no matter what. And I, I think it, it, with, with Strava, we almost have an example of being able to do Seuss balance mm -hmm. on, yeah, on the yeah. entire the entire project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what we do. All right, we got some questions. Come over here. Yeah. Just um, speak. Yeah. Uh, this is just about like the KYC. You touched upon like yeah. how uh, blocking. Um, is like enforced through like KYC, yeah. like their customer, and like uh, so like we mentioned Gmail, yeah. um, which is used by like a lot of banks. Um, like, is that discriminatory? Would you say like, and and like if so, are, is there any like data on like false positives, like like folks who've been like excluded from certain services? Uh, because I like as someone who works in banking, yeah. I think it's useful. Yeah, totally. uh, especially with with the anti fraud and money laundering networks. Um, Yes, yeah, have you had any Absolutely. So, I mean, I haven't been able to look at any of these systems myself. I would say, in terms of it being discriminatory, you know, not a binary category, and that is part. I mean, the KYC stuff, the the AML stuff, that's part of public policy, right? So it's going through a deliberative process. So I, I think in in a lot of ways, that's like beyond my my pay grade. What I'm concerned about is when, okay, now Jumio has those processes in place. They're using them, you know, in order to fulfill a law, whatever we think about the law, like we should, you know, debate that in the public sphere. But then they take the, those technologies and they're moving them into areas where it's no longer about fulfilling the law, but is about, oh, I, I want to segment my market in a particular way. Um, or, oh, I'm, and, I, and my concern is that as um, they're incentivized to find as many applications for their technologies as they can for more clients, and that some of those are going to go beyond the bounds of legality and into these other kind of murkier areas. 
And in terms of false positives, I mean, I, I do hear, like, not with um, Jumio in particular, but I, I've heard stories, you know, I, I think one that was kind of internet famous is um, on uh, Venmo, if somebody uh, uh, says something like, um, uses the word Havana, um, like let's say they're at a, a restaurant that has that in their name, then Venmo will contact them and be like, we need to talk to you to make sure that this isn't a transaction that's violating sanctions. Um, I knew somebody who put into their Venmo description uh, IDEK, which is for, I don't even know what this is about. Well, it turns out that's the, the name of a terrorist organization, so <laughs> they got contacted. Yeah. And I think a lot of this, like, it was it was an annoyance for them. I think in both of those cases, it's not really interfering with their, um, their like, economic or social, like, stability. Um, but I think my worry is that once those systems are in place in one area, they can get extended, and that we may not even know uh, in some of these cases, when when those flags are getting um, getting pulled, and then people might end up getting blocked from things that that matter to them deeply. Yes, and just speak up because we're just going to go up the roof mic here, so you're totally fine. Hi, uh, sorry, this is another question, mostly for Anne. Um, although anyone can feel free to weigh in on it, uh, I have worked um, in a policy area that uh, where geo blocks have been largely related to copyright, mm -hmm. and then also where and I don't think this fits your definition, where uh, it's censorship by by the receiving government, and so that's not. Um, but I've seen, but you know, adjacent to some of the things you're talking about, where it's sanctions related or market segmentation related, and um, and to me these seem all, like interchangeable in some ways, but but in other ways, like these blocks have different characters, like how how persistent they are, how uh, willing the 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 site is to you know, continue to ramp up enforcement. Yeah. I was wondering if you've seen those kinds of, uh, that kind of character between these different blocks and how, and, and how uh, sites, how willing they are to, uh, to jump from one category to another sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think so. Let me see if this, if this answers your question. I mean, I've heard a lot of um, companies complain about a lot of regulations that make them have to do kind of differential things for different countries. So data localization is a big one. Censorship is a big one. Um, the World Economic Forum had this big report about internet vulcanization. Like that's something that a lot of like private sector folks and like uh, internet freedom advocates are very concerned about. But then my concern is that some of those companies then turn around and, and implement blocks when it's convenient for them. Um, and so I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I think that they're probably on my side as well as on their side, there is some desire to have it both ways. Um. So in the EU, there's this new data protection thing coming in. Um, and I saw an interesting social media post recently. I forget, I forget where, it, where I saw it, but it said, you know, people used to lie and said they were over 18, and now people are going to lie and say they're under 18 and somewhere in the EU. So I guess that's kind of like the other side of the coin from geo-blocking is this sort of kind of, it's a bit like in legal cases when you go forum shopping, if you sue someone in the right in the right jurisdiction sure. for the right law. Um, I guess, yeah, I was wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, if, I wonder if you all can speak to about like this question of how people end up Get, I mean, people respond to these things in not necessarily in the intended ways, right? I mean, not like the way that people do their drawings on Strava and just this idea of like surveillance that people people have agency and, and so the systems might not be used as intended. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, you actually mentioned like James Ferguson in your talk and I mean, don't read his book because it's really boring, but like, <laughs> it's hot, like he has this whole concept of like the anti-politics machine, and like basically it's like, you know, there's this one like consequence, but then like it creates an unintended consequence, but that, that has like all of its politics. That's like the Cliff Notes version of the anti-politics machine. Point being, like I think, you know, people do respond to these, you know, these things in their own way, and like in some ways it's just, you know, surveillance. It's like turning the eye back. In some ways, sometimes that's you know subversive. Sometimes it's you know funny. Like it takes place, but I think it's more so important to like distinguish between like Sue's valence and then Simone Brown's like 
Dark Zoo's valence, which is like, I'm not only responding to this, but I'm responding to this in a critical way, where I'm essentially kind of turning eye on the fact that like, I know that you are surveilling me as a form of control and as a form of violence. And so I think maybe it's, it's important to question like, when the eye is being turned back, like, what is the intention behind that, you know? Any other questions, y'all? I'll throw one out. Yeah, go for it. So I come at this from a data analytics point of view. You know, data is being collected. Mm -hmm. We have data out there. Data is being collected. Uh, some of the data that is being collected is being used for purposes that we think we understand, and some of it's being used for purposes that we really don't understand. Um, is the issue really that the data is being collected? or is the issue that the data is being collected and being used for something that we didn't really understand as a user community. And, and if it's the latter, um, what do we need to do as a user community to understand that better? Whose job is it to educate us that data that we're, we're providing is being used for a purpose that we really don't understand? I, I think that um, sort of like, no. Um, because like here we even have Strava like collecting data and doing a thing with it that they don't understand, um, and I think that's often the case, and increasingly the case as we see more and more machine learning and algorithms that nobody really understands how they work. And the question to me is not like the data is there; it's being collected in many ways just by the operations of these systems. And to me, the, it, it has to be who owns the data and who controls it, and there we need to have the, the political imaginary to think about, well, what, what does that mean? Even saying something like, well, you know, socialize, socialize the data. We don't know what socializing the data means. And we have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I thought I was interested in what you were saying at the end about like machine learning, taking on like, what, what, like that's a really interesting concept to me that like, you know, we're teaching, I don't know anything about text, like we're teaching like, algorithms or whatever to censor people and to block websites and to me like that's pretty fucked up that like you know we have these processes in place which like I view as forms of social control I think like without saying it like I can understand like who's being surveilled like who's being blocked like you know looking at like the maps like like what parts of the world like you know are like not hot like which websites and like which countries like don't have access to the internet like I mean it's kind of like this elephant in the room so having said that, like it's interesting that we're now kind of depoliticizing it by having algorithms like doing these forms of surveillance and social control. Like, and it's interesting because like when it's an algorithm, like it's not like you know the big scary mean state. It's like oh, it's just data. But it's and I could just throw one more thing in there though. The algorithm is based on a training set mm -hmm. that could be completely and utterly biased. Mm -hmm. So right. I, I think that opens up even more issues. Oh, totally. yeah. Or wrong. Oh. Or wrong. Exactly. And I think too, to me, it's like, yeah, understanding is important, but like, I think a lot of times people actually, there, there are a lot of cases where people know very well how their data is being used, or they have, a, they have actually a pretty good model. Like, a lot of the, the kind of cases I'm talking about, like, people are well aware that like, they're getting denied because their credit card is from, you know, Lagos, or like, they, they know. Um, and so, and I think that, again, ties into to your shoes as well, it's like people are aware of the way that surveillance is being used against them. So it's not just to me about that understanding, but about like what choice people have and about um, building in kind of ability for them to be in dialogue with the people making the systems to say, okay, yeah, I see how you're using um, this data, but that's uh, in a way that is still being used against me. Yes. Um, just to pick up on the point Jasmine made just now, I think about using algorithms to kind of depoliticize these types of these types of decisions is a really interesting thing and kind of like an important thing to acknowledge. Um, going back to the idea of training data again, I guess there's a question around this, I don't know who it's for, and it's really vague, I'm really sorry, but um, the interesting thing about that idea of um, this sort of assumption that, um, sorry, I'm just trying to work this out of my head before it comes out my mouth. Um, this idea that um, we can use, um, or not we, but the people doing this things can use um, algorithmic forms to kind of increase inclusion rather than just to kind of use these kind of cool screen blocks. Um, the issue of training data is, a, is an interesting one because when the kind of history of that kind of practice has been done through these cool screen blocks, where does the data come 
with which to train a more nuanced model? Like, is there any work being done on how we how we might start identifying fraud in a way that is nuanced, that doesn't depend on that kind of history of course, yeah. kind of surveillance and control? I'm sure there is. I'm I'm not super aware of it. I think, but I think that is exactly my the problem. My concern is that okay, you think that you want to include more people, very yeah. laudable. But yeah, you're still basing your training data on all these years yes. where these blocks were in place. So how are you going to do that without kind of further inscribing those blocks? But in terms of work that's being done, I mean, I think there is. I, I'm lucky to be um, personally funded by the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity at UC Berkeley. I think some of the people there are trying to look into what are more like creative or alternative ways to do security in ways that aren't going to um, just further these uh, discriminatory patterns. But I'm not, I can't yeah. give you a good answer. I have a question for Jasmine, actually. So naturally, when I was hearing your uh, presentation, uh, I immediately thought of the School of the Americas, where they train military officers and they bring in various people. And it occurs to me that in the military setting, this is a very commonplace practice, that you send officers over to other nations, perhaps that have technical expertise, you don't. I know the US has trained, for example, Colombian troops in counterinsurgency techniques, and Colombia, in turn, is now training other South American states in counterinsurgency techniques because of their war against the party. Do you, so do you see this as being interesting, the fact that it's starting to encroach on civil society, more so in the United States, like we're having our police force get more involved in sort of militaristic tactics? Or, or uh, I guess in this, my question is, how do you see this being a lot different than what's already going on in the military sphere of things, where they've been constantly training officers for back and forth? Is this bleeding over more into quote unquote civil society, or is it because these societies are being trained, have a very close mix of the military and civil policing, where there's not so much two different branches, and pretty much it is one military force? Do you see that as an interesting development or a continuation of some of the older ways that have been, been used, if that makes any sense? Ooh, um, I mean, to be frank, like, I don't really distinguish, like, the police from the military. Like, I think the police are militarized. I think, like, I view it as one, like, apparatus. I mean, I think that, like, statistically, like, the American police forces, I guess, have become more militarized. And I think that, you know, in the last like five years we have seen that. I think like a very salient example is um, what happened in Ferguson in 2014, where it was a very like, you know what I mean? It was a very visual representation of the militarization. But like, I think that like the two have always been embedded. And I think that, you know, maybe to flip it a bit, I think that maybe society hasn't really done a very good job of understanding, I guess, the origins of law enforcement. I mean, in a, like, if we're talking about the American case, like, law enforcement, like, going back to slavery and, like, upholding slavery. So, I mean, like, a lot of people don't like to think about the fact that, like, you know, law enforcement is a product of slavery. It is a product of upholding slavery or of upholding imperialism. And so I think that in terms of how this affects civil society, um, I have seen increases, cool. I have seen increases in, you know, this like dark surveillance. So we do have growing unrest. It's not new. People have always been pissed off that like the police for many, many, many years kill people. You know, it's like it's not new. I think maybe what's new and is changing is that we're seeing ways in which we can kind of communicate dark surveillance and ways in which we can form solidarity networks to kind of respond to this. But I think it's kind of dangerous to kind of like separate the military and the police because like they're doing the same things in my opinion. So hopefully that makes sense. Any other questions from the audience today? All right, I'm going to let y'all go a little bit early, get ready for that next session. Well, thank you for kicking off the Rise of the Web in outstanding fashion. Give our panelists a